Okay, well, listen, let, let, let's get started. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce Denise Kai as our cyber lecturer today. Denise joined us, I think about five years ago, if I'm remembering correctly. Three and a half, maybe? Three and yeah. a half. Oh my gosh. Okay, so uh, uh, Denise, uh, uh, my recollection of five is an indication of just how dramatic an impact Denise has already had on our campus. And I really mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, just been wonderful as a scientist and a member of our community uh, and a leader nationally and internationally in uh, the use of calcium imaging to uh, teach us about uh, formation of, mem of, of, of new memories and their recall. So Denise, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. And thanks for the invitation and for all of you guys for joining. Let me just share my screen. Looks good. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so my lab is really interested, in how is it that we're able to somehow accumulate what seems like an infinite number of memories across our lifetime? Um, and the brain is so good at being able to know how to store it and sort it, relate things that should be related, separate things that should be separated, so that we can later retrieve and do mental time travel. And I would argue that the accumulation of our memories across our lifetime is what defines the human experience. And so my lab is really trying to understand how is it that our memories change across time and experience, as well as its implications for uh, uh, PTSD and aging. And um, the title of the talk today is The Brain in Motion and How Ensemble mm -hmm. Fluidity Supports Memory Updating. But if I were to give it a second title, it would be Celebrating Collaboration, because as you'll see today, that it's teamwork that makes the dream work. Um, all right, so um, the talk is going to be split up into three sections. The first section is going to I'm try to summarize some published work that we worked on um, showing how is it that we link memories across time. And this kind of sets up the foundation for the second story, which is unpublished work. So we would love your feedback on how is it that after we learn, our memories can update through um, an offline uh, ensemble reactivation. And then the last part of the talk is really going to talk about our efforts towards uh, developing open source uh, neuroscience tools. Okay, so um, the question I'm going to ask today is, right, how is it that we're able to link memories across time? And, um, you know, it's amazing that our brain is able to do this. And for example, you know, I might think back to one of the best days of my life. And this is the day that I got married. And I might recall that morning when my dad walked me down the aisle and despite promising me he would not ugly cry, he was so moved by the man I was about to marry. And thinking about that experience might then trigger a subsequent memory here as when Tristan Schumann, who also happens to be faculty here, um, when you know we're finally married and we get to toast our friends happily ever after, no more wedding planning um, at all. And thinking about that memory might then trigger a subsequent memory, such as later that evening, when our guests fully took advantage of the open bar, right? And so how is it that my brain is able to relate these distinct episodic experiences across a day and separate it from other experiences, such as here, Tris and I toasting in Napa Valley to a different occasion? And I'm just gonna give you guys a take home message. And what I'm gonna to try to convince you today is that one of the ways we're able to link these distinct experiences across time is by the co-allocation or sharing a neural ensemble such that then when I think about my dad walking me down the aisle, because it shares some overlapping neural ensemble with you know, us toasting to our guests, it's gonna trigger that related memory. Okay, so when we first started, right, we didn't know a lot about how multiple memories are um, encoded in the brain, but we learned a lot about how um, single memories are processed. So for example, a lot of literature suggested that after learning, these memories get encoded as sparse neural ensemble, also known as memory engrams. And this is the sparse neural ensemble really distributed across many brain regions. And the recall of a memory um, reactivates many of those same cells, right? And this, this neural ensemble is thought to underlie a very stable representation of this memory. And the way that our brain knows is this blue context and not this red context is because if the animals are recalling a different memory, then different cells get reactivated. So this is suggested that different memories get encoded in different neural ensembles. So when I first started 
um, you know, asking these questions about memory linking, um, I was working as a postdoc in Alcino Cell Lab, and we were really interested, why is it that this particular cell gets to encode the memory and not its neighboring cell, which seemingly gets very similar inputs, right? And a number of studies around that time um, suggested that memory allocation, the rules that govern which cells get to encode the memory was not random. And um, Sheena Jocelyn showed while she was in Alcino Silva's lab and um, work from her own lab as well, show that when she injected CREM, and this is a transcription factor that's been shown to be very important for memory consolidation. But when she injected CREB into a sparse population in the amygdala, and um, when the animals then were tone conditioned, and uh, it's many of these cells that had CREB, that were overexpressed with CREB, that encoded the memory. So that's odd. Why is it that CREB, that's important for consolidation of memory, how is it able to allocate the memory? Luckily at the time, um, you know, Eric Nessler already figured out with Robert Malenka, um, and they discovered that CREB increases excitability neurons. So Yujo from Alcino Silva's lab also patched on some of these CREB positive neurons and indeed found that they're more excitable. Um, and this led to the very simple hypothesis that CREB increases excitability and this increase in excitability, this readiness for these cells to fire and capture that memory is what allocates the memory. And so while I was in lab, we and others wanted to directly test this idea that can we bypass CREB and can excitability alone um, allocate the memory? And uh, I don't have time to go into all the details, but in essence, we found that whether we optogenetically um, or chemogenetically increase the activity of the cell, it would allocate the memory. And others have shown that um, you can also electrically uh, increase current in the cell and that would also lead to increased allocation. And these studies have also been shown by Sheena Johnson's lab and many others. So that was really exciting, but just because you can force cells to fire, right, doesn't mean that the brain actually uses this process to allocate memories. And one of the things that we noticed was that, you know, excitability um, has endogenous fluctuations in the brain across time and it's kind of this long process. And so we started thinking maybe the endogenous fluctuations of excitability may be a way to link memories across close in time. So for example, one of the ways that excitability is modulated is that after learning, there's transient increases of excitability um, in hippocampus that comes up on the order of hours and goes back to basal levels across days. And um, just to confirm that this is actually in the cells that encoded the memory or that part of this neural ensemble, uh, here, Ling Shuan Chen, I'm sharing data from a very talented uh, postdoc that Tristan Schumann and I share. And this is with help from Robert Clem because uh, Ling Shuan was one of the first postdocs in my lab and we didn't even have our, uh, our rig set up. And so Roger was so kind to let us patch in his lab. And so here Ling Shuan shows that when she patches onto these cells that were activated during the initial learning five hours later, indeed that there was a learning induced um, increase in excitability in specifically those cells that had been activated, such that if she were to patch on those cells seven days later, they came back to basal levels. So this gave us confirmation that indeed this might be a good time window to test the ability to link memories. Now, um, if it's excitability, right, that allocates memories, then if excitability is high in these blue neurons five hours later, then when the animals learn a different experience, right, then we would expect that many of these same cells would encode now this red box compared to when they come back days later, you know, when excitability is back to basal levels, this green box would be encoded by an independent population of neurons. And this is kind of what's consistent with the literature that, you know, different cells are encoding different memories. So I'm going to show you some data where we test the prediction that memories within this window of increased excitability are indeed co-allocated. Now, as the psychologist, I really want to know why the heck would the brain want to right, share this overlapping neural ensemble? And we predicted that the reason the brain does this is so it can temporally relate memory, such that when you think of one memory, such as the blue box, it's going to trigger the recall of the red box more than the green box. And a hard test of this hypothesis is, you know, then what happens in disorders where this excitability mechanism is disrupted and specifically um, with aging, we know that there is decreased excitability in C1 of hippocampus. And so how does this relate to um, linking? 
Okay, so to test this first hypothesis, we're using the UCLA open source main scope. Um, at the end of my talk, I'll talk more about our efforts in um, uh, developing and disseminating uh, open source tools. And so this is a, just a tiny microscope that we can put on the animal's head. And what it allows us to do is to peer into the brain and look at the cell's activity or proxy of cell's activity through GCAM. And this is actually one of our first videos. And I love to show like what we started with and at the end I'll show you all of the advancements we made on this technology. But what you see is the animal exploring a novel box and the top right is the raw signal and the bottom is just um, uh, aligned and uh, uh, with increased signal. Okay, so using this technology, then we can then ask, what is the neural activity or the neural ensemble that is active as animals explore three different contexts separated by seven days and five hours? So importantly, we found that, you know, on average, right, um, as explored each of these contexts, there are about 600 cells that we saw that were activated. So there's not a difference in the number of cells are activated. However, we expected that, you know, different cells or different ensembles would represent different contexts. And the real question, right, the, the, the money plot is really asking what is the um, overlapping ensemble between two contexts separated by five hours compared to seven days? And we expected that two contexts separated by five hours would have an increased amount of overlap in the inner ensemble, which is what we found. So just by pushing two different contexts closer in time, the hippocampus um, has this increased overlapping ensemble. So then to test, Right, what is the behavioral consequence of sharing this overlapping ensemble? And we wanted to ask, well, then does recalling one trigger the recall of the other? So to behaviorally test this, we did an experiment similar to what I showed you, which is that animals explore three contexts separated by seven days and five hours. Here, each row is just a different group of animals. To probe its behavior, we bring the animals back two days later and we, boom, we give it a shock. Sorry if I hurt your ears there. And then we um, put them back in each of the three contexts and ask for their behavioral memory. And so when the animals go back to the blue box, you know, they might think, oh, shiznit, I've been shocked here. And they freeze as an expression of remember being shocked in that context. Now, when they go back to the green context, we expect that they recall the memory of being in that green box, but they were never shocked in that box. And so they, right? Like, hang out and um, explore the context, and they freeze a lot less because they've never been shocked in that box. So the million dollar question is what happens when they go back to the red box, right? So they've never been shocked in the red box, but we expect that they recall the memory of the red box and thinking of that red box will then trigger the recall of the blue box and they think, oh, shit, sniffs and freeze, which is what we see. And here I just wanna point out that this is not, this transfer of fear is specific. Right? It's not that they freeze just as much in the context they saw seven days ago, um, but that's specific to the context they saw five hours ago. And so these data together suggest that um, sharing a neural ensemble is a one way to link memories encoded close in time. And so the last prediction we wanted to test is what happens in older mice. Um, and what uh, the literature suggested was that with um, increasing in age in mice, that in C1, there's actually a deficit with learning induced excitability. And uh, Ling Shuang Chen here um, uh, confirmed this, where she patched on. So on the bottom left is what I showed you before. These are young animals. So five hours later, the cells that were active during the initial learning experience had an increased um, excitability. And in these older animals, and this is middle aged, um, we see that while there's no difference in resting memory potential or um, these kind of measures, there was a lack of learning induced excitability. So then we pre uh, predicted then if there wasn't this increase in um, learning induced excitability, right, there would not be uh, this ability to co allocate the memory. So here um, I'm going to show you some similar experiments um, in, that we did in young animals and in older animals. And we redid the young animals because uh, we wanted to make sure they're from the same background. So in the young adults, right, with this calcium imaging study, we replicated what we previously saw, which was that there is higher overlapping in neural ensemble if the two contexts were separated by five hours compared to seven days. And in the older adults, what we found was that there was not this increased um, uh, level of co-allocation. So if there wasn't this increased co-allocation, then we would expect that the animals, in the older animals, they would not be able to temporally link information. 
So to test this, this is a similar behavior experiment to, excuse me, what I showed you before. So in this experiment, animals explore two contexts separated by five hours. We know that in the young animals, there is an increased overlap in the neural ensemble. Um, but in the older animals, there's not, right? And so in the young adults, we've replicated what we've seen before, which is that um, now when they go back in the shock context, we see that they do indeed freeze in the shock context. When they go back to that red context, seen five hours prior to the blue, indeed they transfer that fear to that red context. And it's specific as they do not freeze in a novel context, right? So this linking is temporally specific. In the older adults, what we find is that while the animals freeze in the blue context, right? They remember being shocked in this blue context and they can process single memories just fine. But what's interesting is that they don't transfer that fear to that red context that was seen five hours prior, probably because there is not that increased co-allocation. And in fact, they don't freeze more than in a novel context. Um, what's also really interesting is that here, in the older adults, they freeze a little bit more in the novel context compared to the younger adults. And this is replicating what other, other people have found in the field, which is that as, um, as animals get older, they tend to generalize more. And we think maybe this is a, maybe a compensatory mechanism, right? That as, uh, as animals get older, if they can't specifically, if they can't temporally specifically link memories, then it might be better safe than sorry to uh, generalize, right? You don't want to get eaten by the hawk. And so, okay, so this is kind of sad, I know, right? As we get older, we start having these memory deficits and this temporal linking happens even before, like major cognitive deficits. Um, but this is a story of hope. And that if the idea is that if it's really the, the, the decreased excitability and the lack of the co-allocation, now what are we artificially increase excitability and artificially link memories um, or uh, artificially co-allocate the memories. So to, uh, to test this idea, we turn to uh, chemogenetics. And here we're using the HM3DQ um, where we uh, infect this into hippocampus um, in, in these older animals. And this is infecting very sparse population, about 15% around the injection site, but really only about 1% across the entire hippocampus, right? It's really small population of neurons. And what we do here is prior to these older animals exploring either uh, exploring the red context, we inject CNO and so we artificially activate a small subset of those neurons in the hippocampus. And five hours later, prior to entering into the blue context, now we reactivate those same neurons with CNO and try to bias the two contextual memories together in hippocampus. And um, for our control animals, we just inject saline prior to um, then going to the first contact and we inject CNO before the second. Similarly, with our other behavioral experiments, we bring them back, we shock them, and now we ask, do they transfer the fear of that memory from the blue context to this red context, like in young animals? And they do. And so this suggests that in older mice with decreased excitability um, that have disruptions to linking, memories can be rescued by artificially increasing activity and um, uh, co-allocating the memories together. So um, these studies together suggest that uh, one of the ways that we can temporally relate memories close in time is through the co-allocation uh, of these memory ensembles. And this is also how we're able to separate memories distinct across time. And we really think that this is a global mechanism um, across brain regions and across memory domains. And while I don't have time to highlight all of the work, um, but if you guys are interested in this process, um, there's so many other labs that are also studying this in, in different domains. And so amazing work from Shana Johnson's lab and Carl Inukuchi's lab has shown that with two amygdala dependent memories, um, that uh, amygdala also shares many of these similar properties in co-allocating uh, memories close in time. And this also extends to uh, what we typically think of as place cells and even time cells. So Joe Loikep and uh, Mark Schnitzer, Yang Ziv, uh, Will Mao, who's a postdoc in my lab, but when he was in Howard Eichenbaum's lab, also show this in place cells and time cells. And this seems to extend to humans too, which is ultimately what we're interested in. And Allison Preston has shown using fMRI imaging that 
um, using MVP analysis, brain images, having close in time, share more uh, representational similarity than when they're further in time. And I collaborated with my PhD advisor, Sarah Menick, to show that these behavioral phenotypes of transfer of fear for two events that happen close in time compared to further in time also happens in humans. And Mark Howard has really beautiful computational uh, theoretical frameworks that really kind of um, help us understand uh, the math behind all of this. So um, that is the summary of some of the published work um, prior to coming to Mount Sinai. And um, you know, when we started the lab here, uh, we started wondering, well, you know, all of the, the experiments I described to you so far, right? So we were trying to mimic kind of like everyday memories, you know, episodic memories as you go through a day, you have an experience. Um, and they weren't, uh, we didn't add the shock value until later. And, um, you know, when I came here uh, with Joe Zaki, who's co-mentored by Kanika Rajan and Zach Pennington, who's a postdoc in the lab. Sorry, Joe is a graduate student. Um, and they have this a uh, really rich background looking at fear and trauma and how this might, you know, alter relationships. And so um, we start asking um, instead of kind of neutral memories, right? What happens if you increase the negative valence of an experience? And so based upon, you know, my prior work, I predicted that if you made an experience really negative, right? Maybe one of the things that increases excitability of that experience and extends linking prospectively such that now, um, instead of just linking experiences within a day, we're going to, if it's really bad, right, we're going to link this memory across days. Um, now, Joe and Zach have the opposite intuition, and they said, Denise, that doesn't really make sense, right? Why would your brain want to link prospectively? It makes way more sense to link retrospectively. If something bad happens to you, right, ecologically speaking, psychologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, you want to know, hey, what predicted this? So uh, moral of the story, or the, the, the chase is that they were right. And um, the moral of the story is hire people smarter than you. Okay, so to give an uh, intuition of like why we want to link memories retrospectively, right? So, you know, um, I, took my, I took my kids to the dentist. This is pretty like uh, aversive experience. Like they both needed their cavities filled. And from what we, from what we know from the literature, um, this, you know, aversive experience is encoded in a sparse neural population of neurons across the brain. Now, if my children were smart, um, it would behoove them to think back in time and think, ah, oh, why do we have so many cavities, right? And they might think back to when their dad made them all these sugary raspberry gimlets, freshly muddled with fresh mint and everything. They're very bougie Manhattan kids. And it would behoove them to be able to link these two memories across time because the past predicts the future, right? And that if they're able to link these experiences, they can better, they can make better decisions about their future. So um, before we get into asking, you know, how is it that negative valence um, alters the temporal window, let's first ask, what about for neutral memories, right? So um, I, what I showed you was five hours and seven days. Let's fill in some time points in between. So in this experiment, we did classroom imaging of, of the hippocampal activity um, as animals explore two contexts separated by five hours and seven days. And I'm sorry, five hours, one day, two days, and seven days. And so replicating what we previously saw was that indeed there is a higher shared neural ensemble across five hours and this decreased by the next day, continued to go down. And we wanted to know, well, does this also reflect the time course for behavioral linking such that there's a transfer of you know, fear that we can later update? And so in this and experiment, so in this, experiment this meeting. Hi, Zoe. <laughs> okay, um, so in this experiment, now we're trying to put the behavioral linking and um, animals explore two different contexts. Initially, they're neutral. And later on to probe their behavior, we update them with um, a shock and then we test them in the non-shock uh, non context, right? And we ask them for their behavior. When they think of this red context, they also now think of this blue context text and express freezing. And so similarly to what we saw before and similar time course, which is that if two of these contexts initially neutral were separated by five hours, we see that we're able to update the memory and link uh, and transfer the fear, but not if they're initially separated by a day or more. Okay, so next we wanted to ask, um, now what happens if the first time they go into contact, boom, they have a, an aversive experience, right? So to look at the temporal window prospect of linking here, um, we shock the animal the first time they go into this blue context and we ask them, do they transfer the fear to a future context that they will see five hours, one day, two days, or seven days later? 
And we measure this by putting them back and ask them, what is your freezing response in this context in which they were never shocked? So when we put them back, right, what we see is similar to time course what we saw before when the contacts were initially neutral, which is that when they're separated by five hours, they transfer that fear to the safe contact five hours forward, but not if it's separated by a day or more. Now, for retrospective linking here, what we did was we shocked an animal in this blue context and we asked, do they transfer the sphere backwards in time to contact being five hours, one day, two days, or seven days prior? And again, we test them behaviorally by putting them back in the neutral context, despite never being shocked. Do they now freeze in this context? Interestingly, what we saw here is that there was stronger um, uh, linking backwards in time. And here, what we saw is that not only did they transfer the fear to the context we saw five hours ago, they also saw um, the transfer fear to context if it was set by one day or two days. In this case, we don't see it um, transferring across seven days, but there are other conditions which we see them really transfer back in time for a very long extended time. So this is very interesting, right? But how does the brain do this? And I, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of at a loss. Like, there's nothing that makes sense to me of how is it that our brain is able to transfer the fear to a context they saw days ago. And so, you know, we thought back to the prior literature um, showing that um, one way for memories to be linked across time is by sharing this neural ensemble overlap. So we started initially with this calcium imaging experiment, looking to see if indeed there was an increased overlap in the neural representation. And so in these two groups, right, they're either going to um, two neutral contexts or um, the aversive group, the second context is going to be aversive. And so um, just to remind you that in this aversive group, they do transfer that fear from that blue context to that red context later. So um, looking at the cal uh, sorry, looking at the overlap in the neural ensemble for these two groups, what we found was that there is no difference in the overlapping neural ensemble between these two groups um, during the encoding. Okay, so now we're gonna look, what, what about retrieval, right? Because that's where we see the transfer of fear happen. Um, prior to doing this, what we're gonna do is we bring them animal in the neutral group um, back and we give them a shock so that we can equate the amount of fear for the blue context during memory retrieval. And so now we're looking at, again, what is the neural ensemble overlap between the red and the blue box in these two groups? Here, we find something quite interesting, which is that it seems like there's an increase in the uh, overlapping representation between the red and the blue box if the blue box is initially neutral. And this suggested that something happens between the encoding phase and this retrieval phase. And we were quite puzzled by what this could be, but we started to think about, well, okay, so in the literature, it said, you know, there's a lot of literature to suggest that after learning, right, so after going to this blue box, animals go back into their home cage, and there's a very strong literature of hippocampal replay showing that after learning, memories are reactivated during this offline period, often during sleep. And this is really important for the consolidation of that memory. And some work I did as a grad student with Sarah Mednick, because um, we were interested in sleep, um, it showed that during REM sleep is a brain state to integrate what you just learned with past experience. And so we hypothesized that maybe after an aversive experience, somehow this experience is able to not only reactivate what you just learned, but also um, prior uh, memories. And we thought this might be linked to the memory. Also, interestingly, Andre Fenn's work showed that um, after stress and depending on the level of stress, it can open up a critical window in which you can manipulate a past memory. And so this all suggested that maybe what happens is when there's aversive experience, during some offline period, not only what's reactivated, or not only what you get, not only what you just learned gets reactivated, but also maybe the brain searches for a past experience to relate it to. So um, to test this idea, um, Joe Zaki did another calcium imaging experiment. And here uh, we slightly changed the paradigm. And here uh, now we're just comparing animals that go into a second context in which they receive a baby shock or um, they go into second context and receive a high shock, right? And the idea was that um, increasing the negative valence would increase not only the reactivation of what just happened, but also past experience. And so now we're going to, what I'm gonna show you is looking at what does the offline reactivation when animals are in the home cage look like? 
and um, we're going to split the data into so um, we're going to split the data into you know cells are part of ensemble A, meaning that they were um, previously active when animals um, explored context A, or ensemble B, which is that the cells were previously active when the cells um, explored context B, and then there are cells that were active in both of those contexts, and so those are reactivated. We will uh, de uh, denote them in purple as the ensemble A and B. And then, of course, most of the cells are active during this offline period. We're actually never active um, with either context, and so we'll just call those the non-ensemble. So when we look at the ensemble reactivation during this offline period after a low shock, we see what we would expect to see, which is that um, the ensemble of this blue context B uh, which is represented by the blue line and also the purple line because the purple represents um, cells that were active in B and A. So, so the ensemble reactivation for um, those ensembles were, were much higher. And so this is you know, um, similar to what you would maybe see in the replay literature. And what's interesting is that um, while there is a decreased ensemble reactivation for the neutral experiencing two days prior, it's still higher than um, the other cells that were not previously activated in any of these contexts. And this is kind of consistent with um, the time course of learning induced excitability, such that we know that after learning, there's this increase in excitability and the excitability decreases across days. So this is pretty consistent with what we would expect. Now, what's really interesting is when we look at the group during the high shock, during this offline period, what you see is a slightly different pattern, which is that not only is there high reactivation of the ensemble of what just happened, but there's also an increased reactivation of the ensemble from the neutral context two days ago. And this is different than the remaining ensembles that were not part of either of these ensembles. So these data suggest that um, during this offline period, the reactivation of what just happened, um, if it's really aversive, it's going to also right, reactivate in hippocampus past memories and that this might be a way for memories to link. But you know, just because we observe something in the brain doesn't mean it actually like is how the brain process the information, right? So um, here, uh, Zach asks, well, what if we then just decrease this offline reactivation and this hippocampal activity, could we you know, decrease then the linking? And here, Zach is using the um, HM4DI. Uh, and so the experiment, in this experiment, Right, we have control group that just get the GFP virus and the experimental group, which gets the, uh, the, the dread receptor inject into hippocampus. And during this offline period, he injects CNO to decrease hippocampal activity during this offline period, and then he tests them. And what he finds is that in the control group, he replicates what we previously saw, which is that indeed the animals transfer the sphere backwards to context that was safe they saw two days ago. And this transfer, this transfer here is specific as it does not generalize to this novel context. And by decreasing the activity of the, the hippocampus during this offline period, it also decreases linking. But what you might notice, it also seems to increase generalization, right? And maybe that's not that unexpected because what I told you before is that it's thought that this offline reactivation, this replay in hippocampus is really important for consolidating the memory and maybe important for consolidating the specificity of that memory as well. And so when you muck with that process of consolidation, maybe it makes the memory less specifically consolidated. So then Joe asks, okay, can we go in and specifically silence an ensemble? And so what Joe did here was that he used uh, the tet tag virus, courtesy of Steve Ramirez, and um, he uh, injected this into hippocampus and amygdala because amygdala is also important for processing you know, um, fear memories. And um, what he did was here we can tag selectively uh, these cells um, that are active during this time point. I mean, the window is pretty, pretty wide because it's uh, regulated by doxycycline through their chow. And so this is not as tight of a window as we would like, but um, here we're opening the window to tag cells that are activated in hippocampus and amygdala while animals explore these contexts, this red box, right? And then we can close that window by putting them back on high doxycycline. And now um, we bring them back two days later and we give them a shock. And here, uh, Joe gives them clozapine and we um, mostly switch over to clozapine because you can give that much lower doses. 
And so the idea behind this experiment, right, is that if we selectively silence the reactivation of this memory that was encoded two days ago, can we get rid of linking? And so what Joe found was that indeed um, in the control group that um, replicating what we once saw again, sorry, this is now getting kind of boring, right? That indeed we see a transfer of fear from the blue box to the red box seen two days ago, but that this transfer is still specific as we do not see a transfer to the novel context. And in the group where he selectively only silenced the reactivation of the red ensemble, we see that linking is totally abolished. And so, you know, we're, we're still doing ongoing studies of exactly, you know, how this happens, but at least our current working model of asking how is it that we're able to link um, our current experience to the past to make predictions about the future, right? And so in this example I gave, so here's our working model, and I would love some feedback on this, which is that after an aversive experience, this memory gets encoded in the sparse neural population in hippocampus, but I'm sure other brain regions. And during some offline period, um, there's not only reactivation of what just happened, and maybe the brain searches for other experiences and reactivates other memories that have been previously so that the brain can emulate these experiences and make causal inference about the world. So this is just our working model that we're, we're going on ongoing tests. Um, okay, so in summary of these studies, the first set of studies I showed you uh, showed that during coding, memories close in time can be linked by increased excitability. And um, in the second series of studies um, that are unpublished from my lab, suggest that after encoding, memories are, can, are still dynamic and can be updated and linked to past experience through ensemble reactivation. Okay, so that's it for the science part of my talk. And I just wanna spend the last few minutes talk, uh, talking about you know, this really exciting project that I've, uh, I started working on when I was a postdoc, but we, our lab continues to uh, make efforts towards it, which is developing um, uh, tools for uh, open source tools. And so this project started um, when I was a postdoc at UCLA, and really it was the, uh, the vision, the generosity, and the tenacity of um, Alcino Silva and Paymon Golshani that really gave wings to this project. And they recruited um, myself and Tristan Schumann. Tristan Schumann at the time was a postdoc in Paymon Golshani's lab. Um, and Daniel Aharoni. And Daniel Aharoni was doing his PhD at the time in dark matter. And I like to say we brought him into the light of neuroscience. And so when we're developing this tool, you know, we were like, oh, this is so cool. If we could develop this tool, um, this miniature microscope, and if we can make it cheap and accessible and, you know, usable by the larger community, maybe like in addition to us, 10 labs would be interested, right? And so when we started developing this, we thought, you know, if we wanted to share it with anyone outside of ourselves, it's really important to break this project up into, um, you know, really two parts. The first part is a system, right? So hardware, software, it's what you need to actually run your experiment. Um, but I think the other component of this project, which is equally as important when it comes to sharing and disseminating this, is the resource. So um, we developed a wiki, miniscope.org, excuse me, and we're really trying to um, uh, really meet, you know, different kind of users, right? So you have your end users who want to just download as is and use it as, as plug and play as possible. But I will tell you, none of this is really plug and play. Um, and, you know, so we have the compiled software, the machining files they can just download and use right away. But then there are also the developers, right? And one of the really exciting things about um, doing open source neuroscience was that we would develop something, throw it online, and someone else would go and innovate on top of it and hopefully share it back. And so that's why we also include the source code and 3D design files so that people can really innovate on top of this. And then there's everything in between. And um, so when, you know, I said that when we first started, we thought maybe, maybe like 10 labs would be interested. Um, and so we launched this in 2016. And since then, we have over 4,300 registered Wiki users from all over the world. Um, and there's over 550 labs that have built uh, a version of our miniature microscope. Um, and we think, we estimate there's about over 2,000 miniscopes that have been built across the world. Um, and one of the things that's really great about being part of this project is that 
you know, um, not only are we opening up the black box, if you will, and teaching people really how to use this tool, but I think we're also increasing accessibility because um, the, our version is one one hundredth the price of a commercially available version. And I would say that um, one of the keys of the success of the dissemination of this tool is the hands-on workshops. So, um, you know, we should travel the world um, and teaching people and people will come and actually build a miniature microscope with their hands um, and, and, and take it back to their labs with them. And I think the last, one of the last trips that we did before a pandemic was in Israel, um, where Tristan Schumann's lab and Joe Zaki and Will Malcolm, my lab were there and, and interacting internationally with their international colleagues, which is amazing. And, you know, it's not only us, right? There's a whole um, community of people just developing these tools and sharing um, through open, open source and open science platforms. And so we're just so grateful to be part of this community. So one of the first things that we developed was the wired miniature microscope and the innovation on this was that it has a coaxial cable that is both used to power the data and transmit, I'm sorry, power the miniscope and transmit the data. And um, because the coaxial cable is so stable, we can connect it to commutators and we can do what we call the Denise test, which is shake it really vigorously, like maybe a mouse would, and you don't lose very much data. And again, this was really through the collaboration hard work of um, Daniel Haroni and Tristan Schumann. Um, last year, we, um, we uh, updated um, our version. So this is our wire-free version, or I like to call it the no strings attached version. And here we can power um, this wire-free miniscope with the lithium ion battery. And we data log it onto a micro SD card that is on top of the CMOS sensor. And so everything here is um, just, you know, really um, is untethered. And this allows to really explore more um, naturalistic uh, behaviors. So here's an example of an animal in a social interaction task. And so typically animals um, will, there's two cups, right? And they prefer to explore the social cup over the empty cup. And on the bottom you can see is one of the experiments we, were, uh, we validated that the we're not wearing a scope or, or a wire-free scope gives you very robust preference for a social cup over an empty cup and having the wires or being tethered really seems to dampen um, that behavior. So, you know, in addition to looking into small environments, you know, I now live in Manhattan and I can tell you rodents are not confined in just small spaces. Um, I ride the subway and so, you know, I can confirm this. And, um, you know, I think it's really important to think about how is it that animals process information in more naturalistic environments, such as, you know, these larger environments. And a lot of our experiments on spatial coding has really been um, constrained to these smaller um, arenas because of uh, logistical issues, but now with this wire-free miniscope, for example, here we're recording hundreds of neurons as animals are running back and forth on a 25-foot track. And the track is so long, we actually have to have a camera on each end of the track, as you see here. So in addition to um, looking at calcium activity, um, we're collaborating with uh, Paul Sessinger's lab, with Dan Kircher, uh, Phil Zong from my lab, and also with Daniel Haroni, to see if we can multiplex the miniscope to look uh, to be able to uh, measure in vivo um, neuromodulatory release. And here is just one example of the use. Um, here, uh, Dan injected D2 sniffers in the premotor cortex. And, um, oh, sorry. So the sniffers, sorry, is um, detecting dopamine and that there will be an increase in the YFP and a decrease in CFP when it detects dopamine. And so this ratio metric response gives us a proxy of how much dopamine is released in that area. And at the bottom um, panel, each of the pink bars, the height of the pink bar shows you the um, amplitude of stimulation from substan substantia nigra. Um, and the black squiggly bars or the lines are showing you the ratio of metric um, response in premotor cortex in vivo. And so this, um, these preliminary data suggest to us that indeed we can multiplex the signal and use this two-channel um, miniscope to detect fret responses. So um, now, because uh, there's so much development of this tool, Daniel Haroni's lab has you know, really improved on this open source miniscope. He calls this the next-gen miniscope or V4. Um, and so here is the, the new version that we've now, I think everyone in my lab has uh, switched over to this new version. 
And there are many um, benefits to it. Um, so here I'm showing you a movie, the raw movie on the left and the process signal on the right. And the yellow square represents the size of the field of view of our old mini scope. Um, and then this is right, the, the larger field of view of the new V4 mini scope. It's also lighter in weight and it also has electronic focusing. And one of the things we like the most is that uh, no longer uses a large grain lens. So there's not the chromatic aberration um, in which allows us and better use this to develop um, dual channel imaging. So in addition to hardware tools, right, um, my lab is really interested in also developing software tools and providing the community a easy user-friendly way to take all that calcium data and to, um, to step-by-step -step know how to process it. And this is a collaboration. This is really done by Phil um, in collaboration from Kanika Rajan, uh, Tristan Schumann, and Daniel Haroni. And so what luckily, um, there's been a lot of algorithms published in the field that have shown us what are the best ways to um, pre-process and denoise, demix, and deconvolve these, you know, kind of blurry videos, right? So that we can extract um, neural activity or calcium activity. Um, but a lot of these algorithms are not easy to access. And if you have not taken linear algebra or your or pro in, you know, um, programming, it may be a little difficult to access the al these algorithms. So what Phil has developed is a very user-friendly um, analysis pipeline, such that every step of the way, as you change each parameter, it gives you um, feedback in real time of how changing the parameter alters the data output to give you an intuition of you know, how you're changing the data. Um, and this will also give you um, more reliability as, and robustness as you analyze your data. So in addition to analyzing calcium imaging, right, the reason we want to use Miniscope is because we want to relate it to behavior. And so uh, Zach Pennington in the lab um, has developed easy track, and it's so easy, even I could do it. And, um, and again, this is also using Jupyter Notebook. And so um, there's two modules in, in this analysis pipeline, uh, one to track locomotor activity, uh, with the positional um, uh, where the position of the animal, and it's robust to distractions, as you can see in this video of him inserting this black flag. Um, and this is not deep lab cut, this is not pose estimation, um, but this is more similar to what uh, EthoVision does, except it's free and it's very flexible. There's additionally this other freezing module um, in which uh, what's really nice about this is that similar to like Metasociates per, um, program to automate freezing. Um, but one of the benefits is that if you have some kind of cable or tether, you can crop that out to get automated freezing, even if you're doing like an optogenetics or mini scope experiment. So all of those are available on our lab GitHub. Um, feel free to reach out if you're interested in using any of those tools. So here, I just wanna end that, um, you know, uh, today I got to highlight just one of the projects um, but there's a lot of really cool projects going in the lab that we would love your feedback on. Um, half of the lab is actually really interested in understanding how is it that trauma alters brain-wide changes that underlie anxiety-related behaviors and fear sensitization, and that's really driven by Zach Pennington um, and with a lot of help and um, from Alexa Labanca, who is a lab manager in lab, and she's applying to grad school this year, and Sinai is one of her top choices, and an extremely talented undergraduate, Taylor Francisco, and they're working together to understand how trauma alters the brain long term. Um, and their other part of the lab is really interested in understanding, you know, this stability versus fluidity or memory flexibility um, dilemma or paradox or push and pull, whatever you want to call it. And so Phil Dong will present um, an unsupervised way of being able to cluster neural activity and relate it to behavior. William Mao will look at this problem as we get older, right, cognitive flexibility. And I would highly recommend going to his poster if you want to learn about how we do this um, ensemble analysis. And he'll talk about how to use ICA to use this to uh, do this ensemble analysis. And Ling Xuan Chen, who is a postdoc shared by me and Tristan, um, we'll talk about um, spacing, spatial coding and excitability deficits with an AD Mouse model. And again, this is like all in collaboration with other labs here at Sinai. So we're so excited. Hope we see all of you at the retreat. And, um, you know, I just want to end here. Uh, like I said in the beginning, right? Teamwork makes the dream work. And I 
I, I love my job. And the reason I love my job is because I get to work with just the best people who kind, brilliant, generous, creative. Um, and I, I think I got to highlight a lot of them here. I want to especially thank all of our collaborators. I know I didn't get to talk about all of the different collaborations, but I hope I got to highlight some of that. And of course, so grateful for the funding institutes who put their faith in a new lab. And so we're so grateful um, for taxpayers and for all of the donors for their money. And I just want to end by saying, you know, this past year and a half has been incredibly devastating and challenging. And um, I would say the silver lining in, in this has been the um, the awakening and recognition that we have a lot of work to fight against systemic racism and that, you know, we all need to work together to, to fight this fight. Um, and so I just want to explicitly end to say that, you know, Black Lives Matter and Asians, you belong here. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Denise. That was great and a very nice way to end the talk as well. Uh, we do have time for questions, so uh, I'd encourage people to um, unmute themselves and uh, ask. Uh, I do want to ask whether Xiao Fan is here to ask her own question or whether we should read it. Let me read it to you, Denise. Could you briefly explain the criteria to determine which cells are considered activated or in the ensemble? And how do you calculate the overlap percentage? Does up-down manipulations of population excitability affect the percentage of total neurons entering the ensemble for the same context shock experience? Yes, such a great question. Thank you, Shafan. So um, the way that we, um, in, in, in the examples I gave today, uh, looked at uh, the criteria was, could we detect the cell being active during that time period? Now, I wanna give a caveat, right? So we're using single photon calcium imaging. And so most likely we're not able to detect single spikes. And so um, most likely what we're detecting is maybe a burst of activity of two or more action potentials. Um, and we're probably missing some of those as well. And so um, here, the way that we calculate was just, were we able to detect the cell being active? Now there is probably, so we're doing further analysis on this that um, you know, are the more active cells more likely to be the ones co-allocated? Um, and we're, we're working on those analysis now. So we predict from the initial encoding which cells are going to be um, encoded again in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I see people uh, revealing themselves. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Denise. Oh, and, amazing and, and, talk. Yeah, amazing uh, talk. First okay. Yasmin, then Kai. Go ahead, Yasmin. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I was saying amazing talk, of course, didn't expect any less. I have a couple of things and we can talk later down the hall. Um, but I wondered about, I mean, I know that you haven't studied other brain areas simultaneously, but I wonder the temporal um, relationship between the campus, amygdala, prefrontal in terms of this, you know, this critical window. And also um, two things with, with, develop, with development in terms of the uh, what's the develop the, the critical window during earlier stages of development because that's we know is actually perhaps even more sensitive than the, the adult animals and i'm not talking about the aged animals so that there are some yeah love that question um so we have imaged in other brain regions um so for example uh, well, okay, so starting hippocampus, even within hippocampus, so we looked at C1, but different subregions of hippocampus have different time courses. So C2 seems to be more, sem more sensitive to uh, the temporal fluctuations, where C3 seems to be less sensitive. Mm. Um, but we, in cortex, right, so we've observed in retrosplenial cortex, um, you also see higher co-allocation of spatial memories at five hours across seven days. And really this turnover has really been observed even in visual cortex, motor cortex, and other areas. Um, and, and while we haven't um, studied a lot in amygdala, uh, Sheena Johnson's lab shows that for two aversive experiences, um, if they're six hours apart, they're also a higher overlapping um, representation such that then one also links to the other, where if it's separated by a day or more, they're more separate. So it seems pretty ubiquitous across brain regions. And then you had a second question, Yasmin. Oh, oh it development. has to do, no, thank you. And it has to do with the developmental window of the aversive events, because we know early aversive events have such a long, lifelong traumatic um, uh, 
uh, experience. And a lot of it comes obviously for me, I'm, I'm biased to the epigenetic mechanisms that we see. And in terms of that can impact obviously on, on excitability, but yeah. yeah. So at first I just wanted, I don't know anything about epigenetics, but I bet you it's hundred percent involved and I would love to study <laughs> it. I think I'm, we're at the right place to study this. Um, but in terms of development, so we haven't looked at earlier time courses about this um, memory linking, but we know that at earlier time points, there's increase in neurogenesis and that neurogenesis most likely is also helping with pattern separation and mm -hmm. that might influence um, the, the temporal windows of memory linking. Um, we've been very interested in studying this in younger animals, except one of the challenges of calcium imaging is that because the skulls are continuing to change, mm -hmm. It's really hard to image, but I think Ian Slaymaker and I have some ideas about how to approach this. Well, let me know when you do. I wanna, yeah. I wanna get into that collaboration. Awesome. Um, Kai? Yes, hi Denise. Hi Kai. So, um, a lot of, I think really all of your experiments that you showed with the co-allocation are using um, novel contextual memories. So it's, you know, the, the, the red context, for example, is a place where the animal's experiencing it for the first time. But when we think about memory linkage in the real world, it's often not just everything's new that gets linked, but you're linking things that occur in time regardless of whether they're new or not. So I'm wondering if you've done any kind of experiments where your red context is like a place that's really familiar to the animal. And if you still see that co-allocation or if there's something special about allocation that is um, specific to these novel um, sort of arousing memories because even though that you know that the shock itself is arousing but often just being in a novel context is arousing just in a non-aversive way yeah totally so um we haven't so we just finished an experiment where we were looking at how prior experience, if, so if, you know, if the animal has a lot of different experiences with other types of learning, how does that affect now the, the temporal window um, and, and co-allocation and linking? Um, we're still analyzing those data. But anecdotally, um, when we were kind of tweaking the parameters, it seemed like novelty was really important and that if they were very familiar, there seemed to be less linking um, which is, you know, kind of also consistent with this idea that um, now I forget the term off the top of my head, latent inhibition, um, that if you are exposed to something safe, 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 then it's harder to then pair the aversive stimuli with that environment. Um, but that is a fantastic question that, that we need to look more into. Well, I also wonder if that's because you're looking at hippocampus, because hippocampus plays a role in particularly in novelty and as things becomes familiar, they sort of move out of hippocampus. So I yeah. wonder if you would see something different if you were looking in the cortical region or just basically yeah. something that's not hippocampus. Yeah, totally. So I think um, one study that speaks to this is from Carl Inacucci's lab. So um, they did like uh, condition pace aversion and tone conditioning. This is, you know, amygdala dependent, right? And they're initially not linked. And so, and, and then they, during retrieval, we're able to link the two memories together. And so at that point, right, it's not novel. They've had experience with both of these experiences. And, and when they retrieve them close in time, they're able to then link the two memories. And maybe that speaks to, it doesn't have to be totally novel, but it might be that novelty um, plays a role in linking. Yeah, great question. Excellent, Paul, Hi, Paul. Hey, great, great talk, Denise. Thanks. Um, my question kind of follows up on the previous one and also a conversation we had before. Um, and that, that, that's about the role of, um, I gotta get your picture in there, there we go. That, that's about the role of unlearning or extinction. And was wondering like sometimes in the experiments that you've designed, like in the case where the object comes after the shock, that that first presentation of, the, of that environment might be a form of extinction which is why it only lasted like five hours. But when you reversed it and you had the novel um, chamber, uh, environment before the shock, there was nothing to unlearn it. And, and, and so that's why it persisted. So that's, I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So I was just told that someone in my lab did these secret experiments. Um, and so where they, they looked at the effects of the temporal window on extinction 
Um, I don't have those, I haven't looked at the data yet, but um, hopefully next time we chat, we can talk about it. But I, I take your point and um, it'd be really interesting to look at that. And then a related question, uh, another minute, is the capacity of that memory, like how many different types of environments could be linked to that one shock environment? Yeah, so we just got, I mean, we got, this, that was what the DPT was to ask, what is the memory capacity, right? And yeah. how how is it that we learn all these different experiences across time and what do we link together? How do we build a schema of the world um, and what is overlapping and what is separate? Um, and so those are experiments are underway. And um, in terms of like learning and early learning, stability and flexibility, right? The ability to update new memories. Um, uh, Will has some data on that that he'll talk about tomorrow. But the part of the idea is that this ensemble fluidity, so what has been really weird, I guess, to us in the field over the last couple of years is this realization that memories are not as quote unquote stable as they used to be, right? And previously we thought, oh, cells encode this, this place are really stable and the same cells get reactivated. But what we have found is that this actually decreases across time. And um, what we think is going on is that that allows us then to update memories and encode new memories because now we're serving new cells that encode new memories. And the rate of this turnover actually affects our capacity to learn memories. Right. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Excellent. Other questions for Denise? Well, we're a little past two, so we should stop. So, but Denise, thank you for a great talk and it's great to see the, uh, the what was it? No strings attached? I no mean, strings so attached. I love that term. That was fantastic. Very exciting. And, awesome. Uh, thank, thank you guys all. I hope I see you guys at the retreat tomorrow. Yes. And I just, I was just going to say the same thing. Please join us for the retreat tomorrow. It's not too late to register and uh, we hope to have a great turnout. So thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye.